talking a little bit about Annie Besant and um, uh, a little bio. Um, this is really my TOS talk that a presentation that I take when I go different places around the world and it shows things that are being done in various local countries. But uh, I wanted to make it a little bit different, <laughs> so I'll put, put a little bit of a twist on it, and I thought to myself, what, what would Annie Besant think of the things that we are doing today? How do they um, match or not the things that, that uh, she was interested in in the beginning um, have those things been accomplished when we're on to new things and about to be on to even newer things? So that was, that was my idea with putting this particular talk together. So we'll see. Annie Besant was born Annie Wood. Somebody the other day asked me what her maiden name was, and it was Wood. She was born in London, England but considered herself an Irish woman because her father was Irish and her mother, I believe, had Irish ancestors as well. Um, when Annie was about five years old, her father passed away. In India, they say, passed to the light. I like that. <laughs> um, but he passed away, and that left her family, her mother, in some dire financial straits. The one thing that she and her husband had um, really, really wanted was a very good education for their son, Annie's older brother. And um, they had a whole plan of what he was going to do. And, and Annie Besson's mother promised her husband that she would um, see to it that this happened. And she did, even with the financial conditions being what they were. She did manage to get her, uh, her, their, their son a, um, a really good education and going through all the, the public schools and the university and all of that that they had wanted. This, though, left very little money for Annie's uh, education. And then, when Annie was eight years old, enter La uh, Miss Ellen Marriott. Um, she was a maiden lady of large means who wanted to, f uh, who, who was really intent on figuring out what she could do in life that was useful. She wanted to be useful. And at age eight, um, she was teaching her niece, I believe it was her niece, she was a maiden lady. She was teaching her niece uh, and thought that maybe her niece needed a companion in this, in this school, little, I guess you call it school. Um, and so she met Annie and took a fancy to her and invited her to study with her niece. And over the years, there were other children that joined them. Um, Miss Maria turned out to be um, a, a, a natural teacher. She was really, really good. Um, they, they were encouraged to think for themselves to learn from, the, from nature around them. They made their own books. They made uh, all, all kinds of things. And also, the other thing about Miss Marriott was that she was an, an evangelical Christian. She was very strict about this kind of thing. And they, uh, one of the things that, they, that was done was that the children were taken to help the needy, the poor, and the sick. So this is really where Annie Besant's uh, social consciousness was born, was in Miss Marriott's classes. Annie married unhappily, as I say there, and had two children. Um, I guess in this day and age, I can just go ahead and say it, that one of the big problems, and I read this in Annie Besant's autobiography. She wrote it herself, so it wasn't something somebody else said about her. She and her mother were extremely close. Her mother was very good to her, and they loved each other very much, and she always looked out for Annie's best interests, except in one area. And that would be our judgment today, I think, that except in one area. And it was very common in the Victorian age, I think, for ladies, young ladies' mothers, not to tell them anything whatsoever about sex, 
and about what was expected in marriage uh, along those lines and all of that. So here was Annie who had filled her head most of her young life with uh, uh, pictures of martyrdom. She wanted to be a martyr. Somebody asked about that the other day. Annie actually was into martyrdom. <laughs> I don't know why, but anyway, she was. And, uh, and it, she herself says that had she been born Roman Catholic, which she wasn't, she would have been a nun. And uh, that's for, to our benefit, because if she'd done that, of course, she wouldn't have gone the other route with the theosophy and uh, helping the um, uh, Indians and all of that kind of thing that she's famous for. Um, but the, the idea, she had this romanticized idea, as I suppose many young women who become nuns do, of being a bride of Christ. So she, this is what she wanted. And so the next best thing was to marry a minister. And that's what she did. And she really didn't know this man even all that well. She, she didn't love him. There was nothing like that. It, that wasn't part of her consciousness. So imagine her shock. It had to be extreme shock on her wedding night when she found out what was expected of her. And she had no, no warning, no knowledge of this at all. And of course her husband was not turned out not to be of the understanding type. So, so this, to me, to me, this is a big deal, and it probably was uh, quite a big shock and, and uh, something that lasted for many years. So her marriage was unhappy, and it started out that way. Uh, they did have two children. Um, she and her husband later separated, and I read in her autobiography that they were not actually divorced because of there was some technicality that she went along with where it said that she would lose her daughter if they actually got a divorce. So she went along with being separated and lost her daughter anyway at that time. But then her children came back to her once they were of age and could make up their own minds. So in, in Annie Besant's autobiography, she uh, describes her introduction to theosophy and she says, at last, Sitting alone in deep thought, as I had become accustomed to do after the sun had set, filled with an intense but nearly hopeless longing to solve the riddle of life and mind, I heard a voice that was later to become to me the holiest sound on earth. She talks about this again later. This was her master's voice. Bidding me to take courage, for the light was near. A fortnight passed, and then Mr. Stead, who was her boss in the review of reviews that, where she worked, Mr. Stead gave into my hands two large volumes. Can you review these? My young men all fly shy, fight shy of them, but you were quite mad enough on these subjects to make something of them. I took the books. They were the two volumes of The Secret Doctrine, written by H.P. Blavatsky. I wrote the review and asked Mr. Stead for an introduction to the writer and then a note asking to be, and sent a note of asking to be allowed to call. I received the most cordial of notes bidding me come. So that was her introduction to HPB, The Secret Doctrine, and Theosophy. And then later, uh, she did join the Society. We all know I think at least somewhat about what happened after that. And then she became president of the Theosophical Society in August of 1907, after the death of Henry Steele Alcott. All right, and then she founded the Theosophical Order of Service in February 1908. This was six months after becoming president of society. Part of her inaugural address said, what of our practice? Our lodges should not be contented with the program of lectures, private and public, and with classes. The members should be known as good workers in all branches of beneficent activity. The lodge should be the center, not the circumference of our work. To the lodge for inspiration and knowledge, to the world for service and teaching. So it's sort of like Nikki's little diagram here, where the lodge is the center, and then everything else goes out from there. So 
Six months later, members had come to her and they had said, the first object of our society says that we are to form a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or color. And they said, we think that this should be put into action. What can we do to, be, to have it put into action? And, and Annie Besant's answer was to form the TOS. And in one of the uh, issues of the Theosophist, I think it was the Theosophist, if not that, then Lucifer. Theosophist, okay. She wrote, I hereby constitute an order to be called the Theosophical Society Order of Service, under the constitution of which leagues may be formed for any special purpose on which a group of members is agreed. So these leagues were based on the interests of those people who wanted to work in, in this order, in the TOS. And um, I believe there were something like 60 of them around the world within a very short period of time. And they were things uh, like anti-vivisection, animal welfare. Um, in India, the, de uh, the demolition, that sounds like a strong word, but the dissolving of uh, child marriages. Uh, do so that's thank you the dissolution of child marriages um, better working conditions for people all, all kinds of various reasons um, for forming these leagues now as i said before annie besant she was a social activist long before she was a theosophist and one of the things that she is most famous for is this uh, the match girls strike and the match girls were young women and, and boys who sold um, uh, matches on the street corners in London. And they worked, in the, and there were other people who worked in uh, the factory making the matches. The problem was that the phosphorus in the matches caused a problem with the jawbones of many young women, and they, they called it fossy jaw, where the jawbones just disintegrated. It, and it was a result of working with this phosphorus. So she and others, and you can see her here um, in the picture at the top, uh, that's her in the center at sort of like a board meeting, I think it was, uh, talking about this issue. And then the picture at the bottom shows some of the young men in and women who actually sold the matches. And um, this other thing is a, uh, a, pl a plaque. The Match Girls Strike of 1888 was led here by Annie Besant, journalist and lecturer. And then it talks a little bit about her. So this was one of the things that she was interested in. Um, she and uh, various other friends that she had uh, wrote different kinds of pamphlets. She wrote pamphlets on birth control and on, on other things. And she became an atheist before. At the time that she joined the Theosophical Society, she was an atheist. OK, and so, so that was one of the things. Now, what were some of the other, the most, the most important things, I think, that they wanted to do at that time was to have like better working conditions. Because at this point in history, this was the late 1800s, uh, people worked, they did work in, in various kinds of factories. Child labor was a huge issue. Long, long working hours, horrible working conditions, lack of education, uh, just all kinds of things. Um, she was uh, also, um, in favor of the suffragette movement, you know, the votes for women. And uh, one other story that, that I read in her autobiography was that when she first discovered she could write, she sold uh, an article or a story, and she was so excited, and she came home and she said, oh, look, to her husband, I sold this, and they actually paid me for it. And he said, oh, that's good, and took the money, <laughs> and kept taking it. All. And then finally she just, stopped telling him or stopped, I don't think she's never stopped writing, but she certainly stopped telling him. <laughs> so, uh, so that was that. And um, some of those 
issues. What, so what issues do we face today? When I did this, I was thinking, wouldn't it be cool if we fast forwarded Annie Besant, if she and Jules Verne had gotten together and he offered her a ride in his time machine to the 21st century, what would she think of our issues today? And how closely do, are, are some of them still the same as what she faced? So what issues do we face today? It has come to be, uh, we talked some yesterday about the international TOS uh, naming women's empowerment as, a, as an international issue. And this, it's probably been about four or five years ago now, maybe even longer. Um, so that was really the, as far as I know, the first actual international issue that we had. Is that correct? Sort of. Okay. Um, and since that time, other things have evolved that, at least to my mind, and to lo looking at what kinds of things people are doing, what seems to be prevalent in the world. And, the, and there, are th there are three that I would name right now, and women's issues are one. Stopping violence toward women and the disadvantage, economic disadvantages. Education. Uh, and I found this one little um, picture uh, on, I googled uh, on the internet actually uh, that says, when educating the minds of our youth, we must not forget to educate their hearts. And I would say that's probably at the heart of theosophical education, where we are not for little children at least, we're not teaching them a, a theosophy at all, but we are teaching them the, um, the virtues, the characteristics of a living a theosophical life. Um, caring about others, uh, good character, religious tolerance, those kinds of things. And then something that that has been an issue for a long time, but it, that is very much being spoken about now, and we talked a good deal about this yesterday, youth involvement. That, that I would say, would be our newest um, focus issue. So there's those three. Now, of those, the violence toward women and the economic, that's, that has changed since Annie Besant's time, but is, was there and is here now. It's still with us. Um, Education, I don't know that they, well, they, they, did, they did focus on education for women, particularly in um, third world countries. I don't know, I don't think they called them third world countries back then, but, you know. And then youth involvement, I don't think was at all really an, an issue, because most of the people who were doing this were young and to begin with. Um, but other issues that we also work on today are animal welfare, prominent in Annie Besant's time. She was a, she had a, a card-carrying member of their Ant Animal Welfare League. Um, healing and humanitarian aid in relief of poverty and strife, um, war and natural disasters. Now going back to uh, woman's empowerment, uh, Kofi Annan said there is no tool for development more effective than the empowerment, empowerment of women. And a few of us were talking over coffee the other day and about this issue, and that um, there are, uh, it, it does seem to be a belief that is held by a number of people that if once women can actually become empowered and, and to be able to do um, what they need to do in their own right, then the, the world will at that point start to, to change and turn around and hopefully become more peaceful. So um, one of the biggest focuses in the international TOS today is on women's issues, from safety to self-defense to economic empowerment. And every single one of the pictures in this particular slide is, on, is because of Deepa Padi. Deepa mentioned the billboards yesterday and that's uh, the billboard that they had, the various stages of a woman's life, from womb to tomb, woman is being abused. And we told you what started that. And what she wanted to do was put these billboards up. And she talked to the governor of the uh, region then 
and he was the very first one to pay for and put up a billboard. So this, this woman has influence. Um, also, the picture on the upper right is showing young girls learning karate. There is a school, uh, a, 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 a children's home, a girls' home, in Bhubaneswar, that, and I visited there. Um, they have about 100 girls in the school. 15% of them are under 18, under school age. And uh, one of the things that they learn, they, have, they go to school, they have their regular studies, they learn Indian dance, cultural thing, very nice, and they also learn karate, self-defense. And uh, so I, I watched a demonstration by this young woman, and I can tell you I would not want to be a young man who was messing with one of them. <laughs> they knew what they were doing. And then people also mentioned yesterday that uh, she put together a book called Yes, She Can of articles that were written by various uh, men and women, many of whom, of whom, whose, whose names you would know. Um, and she compiled this and it all on different f facets of women's empowerment and women's issues. And we don't have any here today, but they are for sale if anybody <laughs> wants them. Another um, thing that is happening, this is again, you saw a film, a picture of this yesterday, where the TOS New Zealand donated funds for the purchase of sewing machines. And this is for the TOS Bhubaneswar's Mobile Empowerment for Women project. And they, they moved this from one um, slum area. I have a problem with that word. In America, we don't use that word anymore, but it is prominent in India from one a very poor area to, to the next. And about 10 or so women are, uh, are taught tailoring, sewing, various fabric arts. And this allows them to then go out and earn some income for themselves and their family, families. And I would imagine it also gives them self-confidence and those kinds of things too. And, uh, New Zealand can be proud of the fact that they are helping with this. Uh, TOS Pakistan is another um, uh, place that has helped provide uh, income, empowering young women. Uh, they orig originally received help several years ago from the United Nations Women's Guild to provide nursing scholarships for 25 women for three years. Well, the first year passed all was well, and then the United Nations Woman Guild said, oh, we don't have, we're out of money. And they said, wait a minute, this is a three-year program, you can't be out of money. So they managed to, Hamid, who is the person in charge in Pakistan, managed to talk them into another two years of support. And that stopped, and then uh, the TOS in the USA came up with another, uh, enough money for five students, and uh, that, that is continuing, but funds are needed to continue this program as well. And it, and it costs 280 American dollars per, per student per year. Not too bad, not, you know, not, a, not an enormous amount. Another uh, aspect of, of uh, the women's issues was, is being, was being done in TOS Colombia. They sponsored a, a, a conference entitled Las Guitaquas, um, the Musquas Medicine Women. So these are, this is, um, these were medicine women who, women who work with herbs. And um, the point of this was to promote the study of ancestral cultures, much like we're going to see when we go to the, on the outing, the, uh, the Maori healing herbs. Promo so promoting the uh, study of ancestral cultures and respecting and honoring their, wi their wisdom. And these are women, so they were doing it under, under this, the, that auspices. So as I said a little earlier, uh, another thing that, that has become very important to us in the TOS and the TS is education. And you are all familiar with the Golden Link College in the, in the Philippines. 
Now this uh, part here with, with, says with global donations and current funds, we've raised over $440,000 plus to date. That is referring to the matching grant because what, what happens with the, current, with the Golden Link is that people donate in their own countries. It goes to their national TOS. The national TOS in a lump sum sends that money to the United States TOS. There, this Kern Foundation matches up to $20,000 a year. That changes slightly from year to year, but about that. And then that money is sent to the Philippines. So up until the date, this is probably, I think this is from like a year ago, up until that date from 2008 to now, over $440,000 was raised that way. So that was, then, and so that's allowed them to do quite a bit. So the Golden Link College has been providing transformative education for children since 2002. Um, and so these are some pictures. This uh, uh, shows walking meditation. There were some monks that came and, and uh, taught the children walking meditation. There's a little pond. And then, of course, a picture of graduation. And as you also know, individual students can be sponsored. And the, this shows the TOS Canada sponsors students at Golden Link. A young man, in this case, the young man in the middle who's smiling out there at you, and, and a young girl. And I know that there are other scholarships. There are other uh, scholarships that, that uh, people in New Zealand support. Um, the TOS New Zealand began the Jeffrey Hodson Memorial Scholarship Fund in 2008. Here are the latest recipient, recipients at the Golden Link College. Candice Menensis, Kay Diaz, Bianca Poli, and Justin De La Vega. So you're probably familiar with, with them. The TOS Pakistan runs 10 small home schools in Karachi, drawing in girls who would otherwise not be able to get an education. And I spoke with Hamid not too long ago. Uh, it was when we were at the Indo-Pacific Conference. And he was telling me that the, the, these particular schools are in an area in Karachi where it either cultural, the, the cultural norms there or economic reasons prevent them from sending children to school, particularly and especially girls. So this is a way to help them to at least gain literacy. And then once they gain literacy, they can go on to other schools. They also have the Jamset Memorial School for the TOS Pakistan. They run four different um, educational type programs. And um, it offers a computer lab, children's library, music classes, uh, besides regular education. And uh, they collaborate with the Charter of Compassion organization in Pakistan to promote the cultural culture of tolerance and compassion amongst the students and the teachers. And I didn't m mention, but Quandil here, it means candlelight of literacy. And as you probably know, the uh, TS in New Zealand does support um, two, two home schools in, uh, in Pakistan. Another. Um, facet of the education program. The, in Pakistan, their, their concentration is mainly on education. And they also have the Minwala Montessori Institute. 75 young women have completed this course. Um, and some of them have been, they, they kind of um, train or help out at the Jamstead School. And some of them have gotten jobs there on graduation or in other places. The TOS in Kenya, and there's also a, a number of uh, TOSs around the world that support, they don't necessarily have their own schools or anything, but they support um, other schools. Many of them help the All Cut Memorial Higher Secondary School in Ajar, in Chennai. And uh, this shows you the children, the the upper right hand picture is children in the school there. And on the, uh, the other the two on the left 
show the social welfare center, which is the little kids. Um, they, they take in children uh, to allow their parents to, to go to work um, during the day. And the picture on the top, that's Maria Ardeman from Finland, the TOS Finland. Um, it seems like it's more than once a year, probably twice a year. They send funds and then the teachers will buy the uh, outfits for the children. The, each child gets a new outfit and the teachers get bags of rice and lentils and oil and uh, a new sari normally. And the picture on the bottom is, shows the TOS France. And the TOS France supports a school in Kinshasa, Kinshasa in the Dominican Repo Democratic Republic of Congo. And that's in connection with the Liberal Catholic Church, isn't it? Okay. And again, the TOS in New Zealand child sponsorship program is organized by Vicki Jerome and sponsors 45 children in total, 26 in Pakistan and 19 in India. A new school, the, the newest of the schools, and also there are about 12 TOS schools in India. They, they aren't what we would call the, theosophical schools, they are more charity schools. Uh, but they are run by branches uh, of the uh, groups of the TOS in India. And just this past year, there were five schools that, uh, were, were, that were schools that actually Annie Besant started. And uh, they were under the auspices of the Besant Educational Foundation. And just this past year, um, Pradeep Gohil, who is the president of the TS in India, um, managed to get the, to, to change the oversight or ownership, but they're not really owned, but you know, the, 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 anyway, the TS in India is now, the, it's their schools. And they actually changed their constitution of the TS in India to add education as one of their objectives. They had to do that in order to, uh, and Pradeep is very, very dynamic. I mean, you can imagine the amount of um, talking and reasoning and all of that he had to do to get his board to agree to change their constitution. That was quite something. So anyway, we have now started the Ajar Theosophical Academy in Ajar. And the picture of the building that you see there, that was the TPH building. It's kind of a little far away. And it's different now. Now it has a, a, like a picket, white picket fence going around the property. They have built a, they are in the, per, in the process of making an herb garden um, all around this uh, tree that's in front of the building. Um, on the back, they have built, they've taken out a wall and they have built it down into like a little amphitheater with steps where the children sit. It's just lovely for meetings. And then this shows the children, uh, the one on the bottom right, they're, do, they're doing yoga. On the bottom left, this is a brand new jungle gym made of all natural materials that one of the parents of a, of a child, he and some of his friends built. And they made it all, they've sanded down everything so the children don't get splinters and things like that. And at the top, this is a cultural thing in India where they're making a little, I'll call it a mandala, but it's a, you know, a, a, a painting. And they use uh, colored chalk, sometimes flowers. So anyway, that's brand new. And we started in June with 24 students. Um, we're enrolling for the next this next year, this next term, school in India goes from June through April because uh, April, May is the hottest period. So there's no school then. But it, it goes, so it'll start again in June and we have 50 students enrolled so far. They are actually exceeding, ooh, they are actually exceeding their goals as far as uh, students. Another program in Pakistan is the Education Sponsorship Program. And this picture shows Rim, Rimsha Rizwan, um, and she, wanted to be a do she wants to be a doctor. And they've provided her with help ever since 2011. She was in class five, and she's taken her second year pre-med exams. 
It says here she's confident to pass with high grades. By this time she's taken them and I don't know what her grades were, but I'm sure she did very well. Uh, for over 20 years, the TOS in Sweden has sponsored and worked closely with disadvantaged children in Latvia. And then the other picture shows the distribution of school supplies to children by the TOS Bangladesh. Many TOS groups in India uh, give school supplies to, to children. Oh, I, just, I should mention that the TOS in Australia, as far as we were talking about, that they, they donate also to the um, Golden Link College, to the Alcott Memorial Higher Secondary School, to the HPB Hostel. The HPB Hostel is housing for, I think last year we had eight or ten boys. And the boys come from uh, usually disadvantaged and often abusive families. So we kind of get them out of that uh, environment. And they, and, they, and they actually live at the hostel, hostel and then attend the school. Uh, one of our youth, our youth groups, we had talked, uh, we've talked a little bit about youth involvement. One uh, shining example in the TOS world of youth involvement is Tanzania. And they have, uh, they have a really good youth group there and they uh, work a lot with the Chanika Orphanage. And so these pictures show Aljar Day celebration and a Christmas celebration with the children from the orphanage. They also participate in the Heart Babies program, which is not a theosophical organization thing, it's sharing with another organization. And then Kenya participates in women's empowerment also. They, turn, they teach women um, manicuring and hair cutting and uh, they also have a landscaping program for young men to help them to um, support, <laughs> to help them to support their families. Uh, and they host a library under the trees and, the, and uh, Deepa Shaw who is the little lady on the, on the upper right hand picture in the, in the yellow sari there, that's Deepa Shaw or Usha, Usha Shaw, and a friend of ours, um, actually she's the president of the TOS in the USA, Ananya Rajan, went to Kenya a couple of, two, three years ago, and she was supposed to be looking for their library, and she's driving around and she's looking for a building, and she could not find the library, and finally she saw Usha and a bunch of children under some trees and stopped, and that's where they hold their library, and so they are read to uh, and they are allowed to read, in, and it's in English, so they're learning another language. And they also give parties for the children. That's what these other three pictures are. That one person in the yellow, uh, he's on stilts. Um, and the children have a really good time uh, at these things, and often uh, when Usha first told us about these parties, she said that they served ice cream, and it was the first time in their lives these children had ever had ice cream. In Hungary, a, a summer camp for gypsy children is offered. The, the TOS in Hungary works very closely with the gypsy community there. And they give um, food and clothing and um, very much pay attention to, uh, to education. In the gypsy culture, education has not been highly prized in the past. And so these, this camp was uh, like a reward for children who did well in school. So that was, you know, an incentive. And so you can see, and they've done this for the fourth year in a row, and it's on, held on the property of one of their members, who has a nice property, apparently. And they play games and have spent time outside, and they have nutritious food and horseback riding and all of that kind of thing. In TOS Finland, they have published a children's book. Uh, the book was written and illustrated by Nona Nina Maki, and that's Nona Nina there in the picture with one of her paintings. And her paintings have actually been on display at the United Nations in New York. And the book that they, um, uh, wrote, she wrote is called The Foamy Sea. And it talks about a child being part of uh, a family and being loved and, and all of that kind of thing. So these are examples of um, issues um, involving education 
and uh, support of children, which is very prominent today. Probably more so, I would say, than in Annie Besant's time. That was important then, but I don't think to the degree that we're looking at it now. And then the other things that are important, and I, to me this spills over into youth involvement as well, because this is something that uh, young people find attractive, is working with animals. Uh, many members uh, in Portugal, many members have rescued f cats or dogs, and there's one member who often feeds foxes during the winter in the mountains. And of course, this slide is heartrending, the one with the bear. The idea that some lives matter less is the root of all that is wrong with the world. So that's kind of sad. And these two dogs in this picture are the personal dogs of the, the, the uh, TOS, the director, it's Jose and Isabel. That's their own dogs that they rescued and they're now their pets. And I mentioned yesterday or earlier today, whenever, about the volunteer program that was put on at the animal uh, dispensary in Ojai. And this shows a picture of uh, all the young people who volunteered to help clean up the place. And it has just gone leaps and bounds since then. In the United States, one of the programs that is su supported or sponsored is the Beagle Freedom Project. This is a project that uh, works out of California, and they rescue animals from experimental laboratories. And when I say that, I don't mean that they go in and break up things and steal animals. They do not do that. They have gone in and they have talked with these laboratories, and uh, these are dogs and some other animals as well, but usually it's, it's beagles because they say they're very friendly and docile and everything. And they take the, they're, they've been there since they were puppies, and they've done all kinds of experiments on them. And, um, and then they have talked them, the, the Beagle Freedom pre people have talked them into allowing them to take the dogs once they are finished with them. Otherwise, what they used to do was simply euthanize them. So they take the dogs and they put them into a household that have been trained to train, to adapt these dogs to being around people as, as pets. And once they feel they're ready, then they adopt them out. And you can see the stages there. Another thing is, <laughs> don't you love it? I, I purposely looked for this picture because I knew I had it, because <laughs> I knew Diana would be here. But it shows Diana Dunningham Chapotin participating in an animal rights demonstration in, I assumed it was Paris. So there she is in all her glory with her red hair. Scary. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this again, this is something that I think would appeal to, to young people today. So animal welfare has always held interest for the young. In addition, climate change and other ecological issues are of major interest to today's youth. It is my feeling that if we want their involvement, we must address the issues that most affect them. So uh, then I've gone on, this is uh, 2012, I, I dredged this one up, it's a little old, I haven't been showing it lately, but it, it's to the point. And this was a toxic red slide in Hungary, and where the Hungarian TOS helped uh, with the cleanup or, and supporting cleanup efforts, and that looks pretty gruesome. This, uh, this, this picture right here, that little blob there, that's actually an animal covered in this toxic mud. I think it's a rabbit. Looks like a rabbit to me, some kind of a little animal. And then you can see the fish. And then we have devastation caused by man. And so this is uh, the TOS Italy, which it, to my mind is one of, along with the T TOS New Zealand, one of the most uh, active POS countries in the world. And they give major support to Syrian refugees. And it's hands-on support. They actually had gone into the refugee camps, taken clothes, they took wood so that they could cook, they took shoes. This is a few years ago, two or three years ago. Now the camps have been closed 
well, by the government. You can't go in there anymore. But a number of people have moved from the camps to Kilis, K-I-L-I-S, uh, which I believe is in Turkey. Anyway, it's not too far from the camps. And so they, they have about 30 families who they give hands-on support to. Most of these are uh, older women, widows, or families with physically challenged children. So you can see the man and the little boy with their hands over the kerosene lamp. Last winter, one of the things they did was to give kerosene lamps to people in the refugee center uh, for heat because it was a very cold winter. And uh, the other thing is that they had formed an alliance with one a, a doctor who is himself a refugee in the camp, Dr. Ali Nasser, and uh, he, they formed a pediatric clinic I I within the camp. And lately, the doctor says that the conditions in the camp are getting worse because of lack of food and hygiene. The little boy in the center, uh, the sores on his face, he has less maniosis disease. I have to say that because I'm proud that I can pronounce it. <laughs> he has less maniosis disease, which is caused by uh, in non-hygienic non conditions. And I don't know, I guess that's malnutrition in the other little boy. I don't know what it is, but it doesn't look good. So anyway, they are still working with him, uh, kind of them on the outside and him on the inside, trying to keep this pediatric clinic together. And along those lines, one of the most widespread activities in the TOS countries, if they do nothing else, uh, they usually have a healing group. So this shows a few of them, Madrid, this is Wheaton, Illinois. Tim is in this group. Um, Barcelona, South America. And this used to be uh, he, um, mobility aids, used to be the main national project of the TOS in India. They changed that last year officially to women's empowerment, which I thought was pretty good. And one of the reasons is because the government has now taken over uh, giving mobility aids to many of the people who need them. So they don't really need the TOS to do that anymore. So we changed our focus to something else. And then the little boy on the uh, lower right, he is from um, Santa Domingo, Haiti. He is from Haiti. And the earthquakes in Haiti, which was a few years back now, many people lost limbs, especially children, from concrete falling on them and things like that. And if you look closely, you can see that he has a prosthetic leg there. And so the, the TOS in Puerto Rico, um, they organize like a white elephant sales, that kind of thing, to gain money to then send to the doctors in Haiti, and they pay for these prosthesis for these children. And even though this was a number of years ago, as you all know, children grow. So these have to be changed periodically. And so they're still working on this project. As with uh, people, animals need healing too. And Rosie Ulix, who is one of the, uh, on, she's on the board of directors of the TOS in the United States. <coughs> she's also our, our webmaster for the international TOS. She, she started a, an animal healing service, which, which became international. The lists are now shared internationally. People's names are put into the, on the healing list, and then there is an actual uh, service that is performed, and uh, the names are, are read. And it's being done in Hungary as well. That's one of, the, one of the places. And this little dog, who is outlined in red here, Tobos, is their mascot. Um, he himself, the little dog, is blind, and I don't know if he's still alive because this picture actually is several years old, so I don't know if he is. And this picture I just wanted to show because I really love this poster. It's an older one, 2002, and uh, the TOS in Chennai, India raised money for this media campaign. Uh, apparently there were communal riots in Gujarat, and this is what went up on billboards around the city. And I just love it. It says, is this a Parsi's tear, a Hindu's, a Muslim's, a Jain's, 
a sheiks, a Christians, a Buddhist, or a tear of human agony. And then there is the TOS France, who, as we learned yesterday, organizes uh, seminars on practical themes, such as our carbon footprint, a healthy diet, animal suffering, service in our daily life, solitude on the path, the spiritual challenge of old age, unmerited suffering, the place of humor on the path of service and spirituality, burial, cremation, and alternative funeral services. And their latest theme was education and the transmission of knowledge. So this, this in particular is, is one that really combines um, TS and TOS because uh, it, it does talk about many kinds of things that are TS themes, um, but provides the service of putting them out there to the public. And then we just have a few groups. There's the TOS Spain, TOS Ukraine, Italy, Hungary, England, France. I've been to all these places. And then the International Conference um, from 2008, which was in India, 2013, which was in the United States, and 2000, 2018, which was in Singapore. And in case anybody wonders why everybody's wearing red, mm -hmm. it was the Singaporean Independence Day, and their colors are red and white. So we all helped them celebrate their Independence Day by wearing red. And then I would like to end with my favorite quote from Annie Besant. There is no other in this world. Each is a separate form, but one spirit lives and moves in all. Thank you.